stay up here because you're going to have to answer all the questions about numbers. Okay. So when do you want me to? Can we grab another chair from the side? Sure. Yep. Is there a fourth one? I don't know. Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, very well, very warm welcome to the London School of Economics. My name is George Gaskell. I'm a pro director here, and it's my pleasure to uh, make a brief introduction to this meeting and introduce you to our key speakers. Uh, the report, which is going to be presented today, the UK's Digital Road to Recovery, uh, I think exemplifies three dimensions of research at the LSE. Much of our work is internationally collaborative. We have what we call strategic alliances in, with institutions in North America, in France, and in China. And many of our other research projects bring together leading experts from countries around the world. This paper is a collaboration between a, uh, the IT Innovation Foundation in Washington, a nonpartisan think tank, and members of our Department of Management, a Department of Management that has a number of groups, and in this case, it's the Information, Innovation, and sorry, Jonathan, what is it? Information Systems and Innovation yeah. Group. Um, information Systems and Innovation Group. Uh, so I've introduced Jonathan Lieber now. The other speakers, the other contributors are Patrick Carberg from the LSE and Robert Anderson is leading the team from uh, Washington. So it's a collaborative piece of work. Secondly, I think this paper illustrates the very pragmatic and vital role of the social sciences in contemporary society. We hear a lot from the government these days that we're approaching the knowledge economy and the foundations of the knowledge economy are in what are called the STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and medicine. But it seems to us here at the LSE that the structure of a successful knowledge society calls for complementary expertise to address the social and political challenges that face contemporary societies. And thirdly, I think this project illustrates a concern which is increasing within the uh, LSE, and that is the profound impacts that uh, societies face nationally and internationally of the consequences of the current economic downturn. And we are very conscious that as these policy agendas are changing nationally and internationally, so may this have an impact on the intellectual and research agendas of those of us in the social sciences. But uh, that discussion is for another press conference when we've scratched our heads for a few months. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Robert Atkinson, who's come over from Washington, courtesy of the trade association called Intellect, very nicely, which covers information, technology, and various other aspects of uh, that particular industrial sector. So I'm sure the uh, writers of this report are delighted to have their support today. And Robert, please, the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you, George. It's a pleasure to be here, and I uh, always enjoy visiting London on a sunny day which is about 12% of the time, I think. 
uh, that I, at least when I come here, it seems like that. I also want to thank Jonathan and, and Patrick, my co-authors on this, and even though they're not here, my other two co-authors, uh, Daniel Castro and Stephen Izzel. Um, just a little note on procedure. I think we'll, we will adjourn precisely at a little before five, maybe, or right at five, and then I think afterwards there's some wine somewhere that we can all imbibe. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of background. First, ITIF, just quickly, it's a think tank in, in Washington, D.C. Its mission is to focus on innovation and innovation policy, particularly with an IT focus. We're nonpartisan, we have a Republican and a Democratic member of Congress as co-chairs. Um, in the uh, run-up after, after the election, I was on one of the Obama transition teams and was an advisor to another. And during that process, they asked, can we get good data on how much uh, kind of job and economic impact the country will benefit from if we propose investments in ICT stimulus or ICT investments uh, as a part of the recovery package. And so we did a report uh, which uh, we released in January, uh, which we gave them first and they ended up using and making their case on Capitol Hill and with the media and with other interest groups. And this is a report we, we wrote called The Digital Road to Recovery, a Stimulus Plan to Create Jobs, Boost Productivity, and Revitalize America. And um, we decided that this was something worth uh, replicating and, and Jonathan and I had talked about this and so we're releasing today a report that is somewhat similar to that report and focuses on the importance of ICT infrastructures, both in a short run uh, experience, which is uh, obviously the principal concern that the UK has, as does the US, but also in the long run. So I guess I'd start by saying, uh, you know, the, the Britain is sort of the home of sort of the world's greatest economists. You've got Adam Smith, you've got John Maynard Keynes, and unfortunately Keynes has been out of fashion for 30 or 40 years and now is showing a revival of maybe this guy had something to say after all. And clearly one of the things that Keynes has said, which has held up the, uh, to the test of time, is that when you have your, if you remember your macroeconomics uh, GDP, a formula GDP equals C plus I plus uh, G plus exports minus imports, when C, i.e. consumption or I, investment goes down, GDP is going to go down unless G goes up or unless G, i.e. government, helps spur those things. And that's really what a lot of countries have done, is they, as, as has the UK. They've tried to say, how do we get more spending in the economy to make up for this shortfall so that we can get back to full employment and full output sooner? And that makes sense to do. But what we would argue, and what we argued in the report, and what I think the Obama administration ultimately chose to do, was to say, if you're going to do that, a big share of that ought to be about investment so that you're getting a double hit. So you're not just getting output back up, but consumers going out and buying t-shirts or going to a restaurant. At the end of the day, they have a t-shirt maybe and a restaurant meal uh, that they've enjoyed, but rather that you create assets that can help your economy over the long run. And so that's an argument for investing in things like infrastructure. Well, then the next question is, well, why are we, why are we talking about IT infrastructure? And the answer really is twofold. Uh, IT infrastructure in our mind is the sort of driving force for productivity and innovation in today. Uh, so it's a more powerful infrastructure than mature infrastructure, say, like roads or bridges. Uh, but another key component is that ICT infrastructure seems to have outsized job gains compared to traditional infrastructures. And we'll go through, Jonathan will go through the numbers on that. But let me just say conceptually why, one of the reasons why that's the case. And that's what we would argue is a network multiplier. So John is going to go through the traditional notion in economic analysis. You have the direct jobs, you have indirect jobs, you have induced jobs, which are created by people going and consuming. We would argue in this case with investing in ICT infrastructures, as we talk about in the report, broadband, uh, smart grid, uh, sort of an intelligent electric grid, or ITS, intelligent transportation systems, that when you do that, you create network externalities. Excuse me, you create a network multiplier. Let me give you an example from the US. There's a lot of different studies on this. The science isn't perfect, and so we end up using relatively low multipliers in the study. But I'll give you an example in the US. Uh, in the US, when people get fiber to the home, uh, which increasingly people are doing, I have fiber to the home now at my house in Washington, uh, they on average, within a year, spend $370 extra on other things, like they need, when I got fiber, I had to throw away a computer because it was a piece of junk that couldn't handle those high speeds, so I had to get rid of it, I bought a new computer. 
Uh, my son decided that he had to buy new speakers because he was now listening to m better music and uh, people buy video cameras and a whole set of things. So on average, if you can spur fiber to the home or high-speed broadband of any kind, it doesn't have to be fiber, just high-speed, people will go out and buy other things. And so you have this network multiplier, if you will. And Jonathan will talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, but there was an article today in... Um, I don't know the name, I can't remember the UK paper, um, I saw it online, it's a study by IPPR, Institute for Public Policy Research, that said that if the UK is going to meet its goal of 15% renewables by wind energy by 2020, uh, that it can't do that unless it creates a better and smarter electric grid. So here's a case where if you build a smart grid uh, that has intelligence in it, two-way communication and other components, you will end up enabling other kinds of investment, other kinds of innovation that would ride on top of that, there, and thereby also creating jobs. So that's sort of one key, that I think we think ICT creates a very large number of jobs in the short run compared to other kinds of investment. The second piece, though, is that at the end of the day, the evidence is pretty overwhelming by economists, not just in the U.S., but in U.K., Europe, and Asia that ICT has been the principal driver of productivity growth over the last 15 years. Uh, for example, uh, there's a study done uh, by uh, Nick Alton, ICT and Productivity Growth in the UK, uh, Bank of England uh, paper. Uh, here at LSE, uh, John Van Rien, is John, John's at LSE, right? Yes, he is. Yeah. Well, he's at Stanford this month. Yeah, with Nick term. Hall. Yeah, That's right. uh, Nick and him went to. So they did a wonderful paper uh, for the government that showed uh, that ICT was contributing to UK productivity, uh, particularly in US firms who happen to be in the UK, who invest more in ICT and do it better. Uh, so my advice to you is get rid of your UK firms and let <laughs> the US just come in and transplant and we'll take care of your economy for you. Um, I say that to my Canadian friends, they really don't like that either. So, uh, but in all seriousness, uh, Van Rien and, and, and Nick, and uh, they show that ICT was this big component. In the U.S., uh, a whole number of studies, whether it's from the Federal Reserve Bank, OECD, uh, or a Harvard study found that ICT was responsible for all of the productivity pickup uh, since 1995. So if you look at U.S. productivity numbers from 1975 to 95, they were about 1.5 percent per year. In the post-war period, they were 3 percent per year. So in other words, we just halved our productivity, which meant wage growth, GDP growth, tax growth, all were suffered. Uh, but since 95, productivity went back up to 3% a year. Uh, and as a result, uh, and, the, and the analysis suggests that the, that increase, that increment of 1.5% was all due to ICT. 20% uh, of that was due to ICT production, and 80% of that was due to ICT take up. Uh, since then, the numbers are a little bit less, but a more recent study, 2000 to 2005, uh, ICT contributed about 1% to productivity growth. So you can see that uh, ICT really is this engine. We see it in other countries as well. We see the same, somewhat similar, but a little bit lower on the continent. Uh, Japan, somewhat similar numbers. So investing in ICT platforms is laying the foundation for future productivity and wage growth. Another component of this is that these digital infrastructures don't just create uh, jobs in the short run, don't just create productivity, but they also serve as platforms that companies can then gain and leverage competitive advantage off of. You see that, for example, in Japan uh, and Korea. Some of the leading companies now in, in ITS applications and teletransportation service are coming out of Japan and Korea because they have the most advanced ITS system in the world. And so they have companies that have built to that. They are end up selling hardware and software and services around the world. Uh, we see that, for example, in Korea, which leads the world in broadband. They have over 90% penetration, much of it on very fast fiber to the home or, or uh, coax all the way to the home networks. Uh, and they're leading, they, for example, they're, they're, they're a whole set of companies that are, that are now leading in, uh, in uh, video-based uh, applications, including gaming. So a third reason I think it's important to think about ICT is it doesn't just lead to productivity and job growth, but it also leads to uh, improved quality of life. And I think this is an area where people really uh, underappreciate it. So if you think about ITS for a minute, uh, using, a, basically making traffic signals smart. I don't know how many of you have sat, I, I, I had this experience once, I was coming home from the White House on the 4th of July, and uh, so I got an invite to the White House to sit on the lawn with me and about three or 4,000 other people to hang out with Bill and Hillary. 
you know, special guests. And we're driving home out Massachusetts Avenue, if you know Washington, and there's like, it's like 11 to 12 at night, and there's like five million people all going out and no one coming in, no one coming in across me. And we're sitting there at a light for a minute and a half with no cars going by. Just sitting there. And I thought at the time, why don't we have smart traffic signals that are adaptive? Why don't we have a traffic signal that knows that there's no one there and it just switches the switch, switches the light? Well, when you have adaptive traffic signal control, it reduces traffic delays by 20%. Uh, ramp metering uh, reduces traffic uh, congestion by 10%. Uh, we see the same thing, for example, with, uh, with uh, 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 broadband, where uh, people are able to do all these things, uh, education at home, all the other things like that. Another key piece of this, too, is environment. Now, this is an area where I think a lot of people get it wrong, because they look at this thing, and they go, oh, hey, is, aren't we contributing to the pollution here, global warming, because Jonathan's running his laptop here, and we're having to power energy for that. That's true. But most of the good studies, and I hear, I guess one in the UK as well, which I hadn't seen, most of the good studies suggest that for every unit of energy that ICT uses, it saves anywhere between five to ten units of energy in other areas because ICT is essentially dematerialization. So when you think about that, um, there's a study we just released on broadband that shows that the fastest growing mode of commuting in the United States now is working at home. Uh, that's growing faster than any other mode. And more people work at home largely because now they can telecommute and do pretty much what they can do at home uh, in, in there. Uh, ITS, Oregon just did a pilot program on ITS, found that drivers drove 9% less when they had, uh, were having to pay by the mile. Uh, investments in smart grid have been clearly shown by reducing peak energy usage because you're pricing at the peak and you're cycling things on and off, uh, end up reducing peak power consumption and production. So in our view, that suggests that we need to be thinking about these ICT platforms in both short-term as well as long-term economic policy. Now, when you look at what other, you know what, I've been going through this and I haven't been using my slides. Yeah, well, I can't believe I'm just talking. Here, one of the Where it is. All right. No, it's not. It's a keyboard. All right. That's what we're doing. We just did it. All right. All right. I'm sorry about that. So that's the jobs one. I'm, I'm going to let Jonathan go through that because you're doing that. Productivity, quality of energy savings. There we go. All right. So what are other nations doing? Let me start with the U.S. Uh, the U.S. passed its Economic Recovery Act in, I guess, late January uh, and committed um, a fairly large amount of money to digital infrastructures. And this was driven directly by the president. Uh, he was fully committed to doing this. In fact, uh, push to make sure that these were in the stimulus package. $7.2 billion on broadband, principally to get it to places that don't have broadband. $22 billion on health IT, which we have a terrible, we have almost no health IT in the U.S., so it's a key area, and $13 billion for smart grid. Uh, there's already some evidence that these are actually having stimulative effects. There's an article in the current issue of Business Week that's talking about how in a number of cases, companies who had, had canceled their health IT uh, uh, acquisitions have now reinstated them. Uh, they canceled them because of the bad economy. They've reinstated them now because they know that as soon as they do this, they're going to start getting fairly nice bonuses from the government on reimbursement to make that, to make that work. Um, so the U.S. has taken a the lead there, and it didn't include my other slide. Oh. So that's okay. I will, <laughs> that's maybe because I didn't give it to you. Uh, I will mention what other countries do. A number of other countries are doing the same thing. Uh, Germany's uh, recovery program calls for every German household to have broadband by the end of 2010. Uh, France plans to expand broadband uh, $4 billion, uh, $4 billion, I think, or pounds, or francs. Uh, it's actually in dollars. It's $4 billion worth of, uh, worth of that. Uh, the Finns have committed uh, $67 million for broadband, which for a small country is a fair amount of money. Uh, the Canadians have invested about, uh, about twice as much on health IT as we did in their broadband stimulus, pa in their stimulus package. Uh, the Australians have just made a major commitment on a national fiber to the home network as part of their recovery package. Uh, the Chinese have made a big effort on eliminating taxes and terror, excuse me, value added taxes on computers, and as have the Vietnamese. So what you're seeing is a whole number of, and certainly the UK has done, has done things as well, which Jonathan can talk about it a little later. So what you're seeing is countries are recognizing that this time around, for the first time, uh, you can think about putting IT and IT infrastructures in a stimulus package. So with that sort of overview, I'm going to let Jonathan go into the details of actually how we did the report and what we found. Thank you.
Thanks. Well, let, let me start by saying just a little bit about uh, the, the problem that, that confronted me in trying to take the kind of work that uh, was done in, in such an effective way uh, by ITIF and had such an impact on the formation of the U.S. US no, I, I did that on purpose. <laughs> I like people to listen for a moment. Uh, that he, here, here was a report which fed directly into Obama's stimulus package projects. And what would this sort of thing mean for the situation here? We were not going to have a stimulus package. We specifically were told we're not going to use that kind of terminology. But we were talking about other kinds of ways in which uh, the, the, the budget, uh, we're talking about when, when, it, when it came out last Wednesday, that what the budget was going to do for uh, stimulating the economy without doing a stimulus package. Well, what would this mean then for the, 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 the ambition to see money being spent in areas that would have uh, inf infrastructure effects that would show us where the UK stood from spending like that. All right, so that, that was the ambition. So we uh, took the, uh, the basic concepts of the US report and, tr and tried our best to figure out how they would apply uh, in, in the UK. Well, the, the, the most important concept under, underlying this is the notion of employment multipliers. So when money is, is, uh, is, is, uh, uh, is spent, of course, jobs are, are created directly. And a lot of the discussion in the United States stopped right there. In fact, Lawrence Summers said, it doesn't matter what we spend the money on. We can spend it on retail. We can spend it on construction. We can spend it on boosting any part of the economy. All will work equally well to create new jobs. And that, taken at face value, is true. But you're missing an opportunity not only to create more new jobs than any direct spending would, would, uh, would uh, give you at the outset, but you're also losing the opportunity to create sustainable occupations and to, and to benefit from employment multipliers. So the direct jobs created are the jobs that are hired by the money that's being uh, put aside. The indirect jobs created are the ones that are uh, directly related to those jobs. And then we have the concept of indu induced jobs created. And I'll, I'll go through this a little bit more. The notion of induced jobs is that some kinds of spending creates opportunities for the economy to generate new kinds of activities. And here we get a, an economic notion of the effects of innovative activities and the relationship between public spending policies and the innovative capacity of certain sectors to generate new kinds of activities. And some of these activities go on to create network effects that have knock-on impacts as the networks grow, as new kinds of opportunities arise for new business ventures and related activities. So these arise, these network effect multipliers arise from the way in which businesses change their behavior as a consequence of these new economic activities. They occur in, in, in theory, we can say that they occur in any networked sector, but they occur in particular in digital infrastructures because it acts as a platform that we're all quite familiar with now in the ways that it supports innovative activities of a variety of kinds, and in particular, new kinds of services. So we're creating opportunities just as when broadband first became available and people saw that here was a mechanism for loading up a lot of pictures onto websites and doing things which would very quickly and easily transform material that they wanted to share. 
business models immediately emerged into Facebook and MySpace and other kinds of uh, uses like that, which spurred on employment and other kinds of economic activity, now advertising and, and uh, related other things. So what, was ha what uh, Rob Atkinson did in Washington was to choose a number of sectors where these effects would be uh, apparent in the US case and which, were f which fitted into US policy concerns. Uh, and so health IT was uh, an area that, that Rob studied and showed the network effects in the US report. We didn't do that here uh, for various reasons, uh, but did see how in the UK the infrastructures for broadband, for intelligent transport systems, and for smart grid can have these kinds of network multiplier effects. Well, how's this done? Well, uh, it's, it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy to, to do because it involves a lot of intricate measures, and a lot of these measures are difficult to, uh, to standardize. There are poor comparability among different sources of statistics. We had, for example, to look at the mix of technologies associated with each of these sectors and to see the extent to which they were service-based or based on manufacturing. We had to look at the characteristics of employment in each of these sectors and subsectors and the wage rates in each of these sectors. We also had very difficult time in figuring out what to do about the total employment costs. Uh, if any of you have had this uh, problem in, in analysis, you'll appreciate what I mean. That if you, you, you can take the wage and then you can add employers' contributions and, uh, uh, and employers' taxes, uh, and you get a small number that, to add on to wage, and you get then one concept of total employment cost uh, if, however, you take a more realistic view and see that in a new employee expects certain kinds of benefits in addition to the minimum statutory required benefits, also they're going to consume uh, equipment and there's going to be an increased rental fee on the software that they're going to be using uh, and uh, there may be uh, implications for the office space that they occupy on and on and on. You get a very, very high total employment uh, cost uh, and, and then different kinds of job categories hold different implications for total employment costs. This is again part of the uh, difficulty of uh, putting together a methodology for measuring uh, the, the employment impact of certain levels of spending. So we went through this kind of analysis. Uh, this was in the hands of Patrick Carberg who uh, was tireless in, in uh, <laughs> in getting out all of this data and also in noting where the OECD data on uh, wages differs from the uh, Office of National Statistics uh, data and then the industry sources give a different view of these things. Uh, and these differences make a difference in the, the total numbers that come out and we had to use our judgment to determine how to go about this, this measurement of the employment impact. But once we were able to do that, uh, we were able to calculate then the number of direct, indirect, and induced jobs. Uh, and that was assisted by this concept of employment multipliers, which have been compiled by a variety of different sources, all rather inconsistently. That is to say, the Scottish office has uh, pretty good data uh, that goes up to 2004. Uh, the Office of National Statistics has some reasonably interesting data that's not entirely consistent uh, for 1995. Uh, so <laughs> we, we have incompatibilities there that we have to then adjust for the differences in the structures of the Scottish versus the, the English economy and uh, then look at trends in those industries uh, in the UK as a whole. So very intricate kinds of, of, of uh, calculations, uh, but perfectly um, doable as long as you can root out all of these uh, necessary measures. 
So then we, we came up with uh, the numbers uh, using uh, these variety of sources uh, and made these choices about what the salary levels for different job categories in each of the contributing elements to the, to the broader categories of spending that we chose, uh, and we came up with our costing estimates. Now, one of the things that we had to consider at the outset was what scale should we be talking about? And you'll see uh, in the report that we, we took a, just a number, uh, five billion pounds for each of the three categories, and showed what the employment effects are going to be on, on that. Uh, this is uh, a number which makes sense at a, at a starting point for comparison with uh, what was done for the United States and the kind of analysis that we can now go ahead and do elsewhere to come up with international comparisons. But there are questions about what would happen if spending were on a significantly smaller scale. In particular, what would happen if it's a smaller scale? It, once you get beyond about five billion pounds, we can easily see the uh, advantages of greater employment as a consequence of greater investment up to some uh, well, beyond what we can ever expect uh, the Treasury to, to, to consider or the, the, the boost that would come from private investment that the Treasury might induce. But smaller investments do make policy differences. If a small number is taken, 100 million pounds, 500 million pounds, will we get the knock-on benefits or not? And I think this is an, a matter that we really need to uh, consider very carefully, and it has very direct policy implications about what gestures might be worth. Uh, so here's just a, somewhat of an explanation of how, in the case of broadband, uh, just that case, it looks slightly different, of course, for intelligent transport systems or for uh, or for grid, the knock-on effects and the, the accumulative elements of uh, the network and how employment is, is enhanced at various levels. You can look at this diagram at your leisure. So what do the numbers look like? These are uh, numbers which are mostly rounded down. Uh, I say uh, rounded down. We wanted to be conservative in the numbers as much as possible. We were concerned that if we uh, used multipliers or, for example, used total employment costs, which were low and implied that we would have huge boosts, uh, that we would get unrealistically large numbers. We think these are conservative numbers. The total jobs uh, created or, or retained, retained, this is an assumption that the shrinkage would uh, directly lo lose a uh, significant number of, of jobs. This is for uh, five billion pounds uh, of, of, uh, of spending, not necessarily government spending. I'll come to mix of spending or mix of induced investments. Uh, those of you who know this kind of material well will see that this number is quite significantly lower than what other people have suggested. and. Uh, I think it's, it's a nice big number, uh, justifying uh, the policies that we would, we would want to promote. Uh, and I would caution about the, the uh, use of significantly larger uh, employment effect numbers, uh, significantly larger than, shall we say, uh, 400,000 jobs induced. We have this number here that comes up to just almost 300,000 jobs. Between 300 and 400,000 jobs, I think, would be a reasonable expectation. Uh, others have estimated it to be five and 600,000 jobs, but I think that our model is more robust and a better tool for assessing this. Intelligent transport systems, the same amount of spending, creates fewer jobs. Now, this raises another interesting policy question. If your only concern is to boost the number of jobs, why not just pick the one where the numbers show that the greatest number of jobs is induced. Uh, well, there, there are, are a few reasons, some of them related to the character of the technology itself. That is to say, we would get uh, very few benefits out of intelligent transport systems if we hadn't done more with broadband infrastructure to begin with. 
uh, and there are other kinds of public policy and uh, qu quality of life implications for intelligent transport systems in particular. The other reason for choosing intelligent transport systems and showing what the effects are going to be is that the Department for Transport has very specific plans for building out intelligent transport systems in the UK. The problem is that they are assuming spending spread over a large number of years. Uh, and what we want to show is that you get the induced effects uh, immediately when uh, and at this scale uh, if we, for example, would convince the Department for Transport to accelerate the ske schedule of spending. And then smart grid uh, is this, uh, in between. Again, this is a policy priority uh, for, uh, for, the, for the European Union, uh, in, in fact. Uh, it, it has uh, a form here in, in the UK, which is kind of following things along. Uh, the smart grid will not only improve the qualities of the electrical distribution system now, it will also lay the foundation for an easier integration of newer forms of electrical generating uh, 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 mechanisms. So uh, this is not to say that this, this spending is on uh, wind power or, or solar power or other uh, uh, tidal bore power. Uh, the, the point is that once the, the system is uh, upgraded to the point where we can do the information communication technology functions on it, then it will lend itself much more easily to upgrading with new forms of, uh, of energy. So the policy implications, uh, well, uh, we don't have a prescription for government spending here. Uh, and in any case, uh, what was found in the Obama administration is that you can you, you can uh, make whatever prescriptions you want. Uh, it'll be taken away by uh, political interests and, and rewritten uh, and, 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 uh, and shuffled around, the extent to which we're talking about tax credits or, or grants. We have good policies and practices here in the UK, good precedents for grants uh, to, to homeowners. Uh, I was able, when was it, in... Uh, in 1993-4, uh, I guess, to pay for the insulation of my roof with uh, grant money that came out in, in, uh, uh, in, in that year, the home insulation grants. And uh, the home water meters, I think I didn't pay for my home water meter. I think that Thames Water uh, was paid to upgrade my, my water meter. Uh, I, I had to tick a box, you may remember. When did that happen? That was. Uh, in, in 1999, I believe, 1998. So we have good practices for this. We can see how grants of that kind would work. Certainly it can be applied to smart metering for electrical generating systems. Uh, procurement and government lead uh, are, are, are issues uh, that also can be, we can find good precedence in, in, in government practices. Uh, and there's the whole issue of regulatory reform. I only give one example here uh, because uh, I, I don't want to stick my neck out too far uh, at this point to, to link regulatory reform with employment issues, uh, although it is obviously something that I'll, I'll, I'll want to speak about on another occasion. Uh, Nesta has already suggested this speed for spectrum swap, uh, the idea being that the broadband uh, uh, service providers be, be given an, a concession in, uh, uh, from, from Ofcom to, uh, uh, to increase the speed. Uh, how that would exactly work, uh, Nesta seems to think they have an, an idea. I'm not sure that Ofcom is, uh, is buying into it yet, but it's a good example of the way in which a, a regulatory uh, concession could be given that would have very direct monetary value. Uh, the UK differs uh, from the United States. I've spoken a little bit uh, about this uh, already. I, I think you'll find in the report that we've been very conscious 
of those differences. I just want to emphasize that, that this is not a matter of just taking uh, the U.S. model or the U.S. policy and superimposing it on here. There are smaller network effects here in many cases than there are in the, in the U.S. Uh, this is uh, built into to the model. I was a little bit surprised to find exactly how that worked and where it applied. I think that that has policy implications for us uh, that we ought to look at very carefully too. Uh, some of them uh, are rather far-ranging policy implications about uh, employment uh, costs and related things. Uh, some of them seem to have to do with the way in which the uh, supplier industries operate uh, in, in the UK. So this is something that's, that's really very interesting, but not, um, uh, but not, not developed fully within this report. So what are the conclusions we have? Three billion pounds in each of three areas spent over a short period of time will create uh, 730 or, or so, uh, anyway, more than 700,000 jobs within the UK. I should point out that we also had to take into consideration trade characteristics of each of these sectors so that we knew how much the spending would create jobs abroad. And when we say jobs in the UK, we are clear about what the leakage of these investments would be in creating jobs outside the UK. So 700,000, 720,000, some, something like that. Uh, is, is our conclusion for that. These are projects that are, that are ready. Uh, in, in, uh, in the United States, uh, uh, smart uh, grid metering is in early pilot form. Uh, there's a big pilot project in, in Florida. But elsewhere in Europe, it's well beyond pilot project form. And I think that we can say with confidence that this is ready for investment. Similarly, the ITS areas that we've uh, focused on are areas that have been piloted by the Department for Transport, uh, and the Department for Transport believes that these are ready to go. The broadband uh, technologies that we're talking about are similarly ones which are, well, in some places old hat, but uh, here part of activities which are already uh, being considered or, or planned. Uh, and these are beyond uh, the, for example, BT's Next Generation Network program. We're not suggesting that additional funding go, go to that necessarily. Uh, these are beyond those kinds of existing build-out projects which we, which we know about. The advantage I want to emphasize of this kind of spending over construction, over support for Indust old industries uh, over giving the money to bankers is that we get these network effects and we get sustained job creation that um, some of these areas that we're talking about are ones that are extremely timely. They're right for the investment now not only because the technology and the infrastructure for rolling out the technology is ready to get going, but also because we are, in particular in the case of smart electrical distribution grids, we're, we're at a point where we need to do something about it soon. We should do this soon, and when we do, the, uh, the push that it creates will have uh, significant knock-on effects. So uh, we, we, we've presented this report because we believe that the economics are right, we believe that the policies are feasible, and we also believe that the effects that it has on social benefits mm -hmm. and on uh, personal uh, quality of life uh, are, are all important. We would be I guess happy to extend this kind of analysis to other cases and show what the knock-on effects are there. We've chosen these because of these characteristics of policy, social benefit, and direct economic advantage that we can see now. So I think we're going to have some discussion. George, you want to chair? Yeah. Uh, well, 
Let me open the floor to uh, questions and comments. And uh, maybe if you ask a question, you could just uh, say who you are and to whom you're directing it, if it is directed to one of the two speakers or if it's uh, not directed to either of them, but to a space in between them, well, I'll invite them to uh, chip in as appropriate. Patrick will answer those questions. <laughs> Please, sir. reports which refer back to older studies about the substitution of capital investment for employment. And I think that that does come in some, in some uh, employment areas. Uh, it's not, we believe, significant in the, the structure of the model here. So I agree with you that in general we're not looking at problems of negative employment, but there are some shifting of occupations, and you can see people shifting out of certain kinds of occupation areas as uh, capital investment goes in. But it's not the straightforward capital investment displacing jobs story. That's what we want to emphasize. I think somewhat missing the, the, the connection in terms of where the jobs come from initially. Most of the job impact comes from what's called uh, direct and indirect. So for example, when you spur investment in, uh, in broadband or high-speed networks or fiber, uh, uh, most of those jobs are coming from telecom installers, uh, people who are digging the trenches or stringing the wires, uh, people who are manufacturing the fiber, people who are building the switches or uh, People are installing those, uh, the salespeople, whoever. Go. So, and, and then the next level down, uh, the people who are building the fiber have to buy um, whatever they buy, their inputs providers or things like, you know, I don't know what fiber providers buy, that they, 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 they then have Insulation. inputs. Insulation. Yes. Uh, uh, people who build the switches buy capacitors. Uh, so you have all of those jobs being created. So uh, then this, the other part of this induced part is what the consumer would spend. Um, you know, I think the evidence suggests that uh, th that in, in for most people uh, on the stimulus side, people are going to spend that and get the other component, as well as this extra, what we found in the U.S., uh, you know, 300 extra dollars. So in the long run, you might get some, some negative impact, but I think in the short run, and that's principally what, on the employment side, this is principally a short run thing. I agree with in the long run, ICT investment is not it, for the use of it is not a, it's not an employment thing. There are going to be jobs here. There'll be full employment back in the UK at some point, hopefully sooner rather than later. At that point, the benefit of ICT is really to create better quality of life, to drive productivity growth and efficiencies. Yes, sir. Thank you. What changes in government policies? I could give you a shopping list of changes in government policies. I, I, I wrote the report in as conservative a manner as I could, basing, basing my recommendations on things that are already reasonably well accepted within the Department for Transport and, uh, and, and elsewhere, in, in BERR and elsewhere. So uh, 
I wanted to show that these are feasible within the expectations of policies now. So this is not my opportunity to wax lyrical about wind power or the Bristol Channel of War. It's not necessary to do that or to think about long-term policy implications of these things in order to make the point about how the employment effects of short-term investments are going to benefit. I guess I fear that the Department for Transport in particular is well-minded in their practices and policies, but very, very ineffective at applying them. We see that more in London than elsewhere in the country, so we sort of live with these problems and wish that we had fewer speed cameras and better traffic controls. But that's not a matter of asking for new policies. It's just a matter of pointing out that it would perhaps be beneficial to see this kind of program accelerated within the Department for Transport, and then we might hope that some of their better policies get more effectively applied as this accelerated spending occurs. Let me just add, I'm not trying to speak at all for UK policy, but Jonathan knows and I don't, but it seems to me that two of these three investment areas are essentially investments that the UK government will make at some point. So at some point you're going to have to make investments to get broadband everywhere where the market won't bring it. Unless you want to choose a society in 20 years where a bunch of people can't get broadband, and I don't think that's the goal of either party here. I guess I'm used to the US, either of the three parties. And the same thing with ITS. At some point in time in the future, the British transport system will be intelligent, as is, frankly, every nation's transport system, the developed nation's transport will have intelligence in it. And by and large, the technologies for both of those things are here today. It's not like we need to invent or develop advanced technologies for that. So in many ways, both of those are areas where acceleration, it doesn't cost more on a five-year budget plan. You're going to be investing the same amount. It's just a question of can you accelerate those, get them done sooner, get the employment benefits. The grid's a little different. In some ways, the Obama administration's push on grid was really to kind of jumpstart the marketplace to get enough smart grid projects going so that then state utility regulators get this. We regulate it in the US at the state level. They get the grid thing. Then they start letting utilities basically make their investment back in the rate base, which doesn't need government money to do that. You just get it back from consumers, who end up saving money, but you have to pay for it initially. But in the US, the choice was we weren't going to get there unless we had enough projects to sort of show people that this is actually a good thing to do. Yeah, the UK is in a better position relative to the US in relation to smart grid anyway, I think. So the take home message is don't lose the opportunities from a good crisis. You, sir. Well, I have a short answer that you might expect from an academic. I wrote a paper on the subject. And I wrote it, in fact, for Sir David King's office, for the Office of Science and Technology. And there, also in conjunction with the Treasury and the spending review, they want a 10-year view into the future. And I use that occasion to think about radical changes in technology as they extend out and what implications they'll have for the Treasury and for the UK economy generally. So I'd be happy to share that paper with you. You can find it in the 
the ERR working paper series. But the point is here that we're facing possibly 3 million unemployed. We're looking at, by the end of this year or so, an opportunity to stimulate employment in this area alone on the scale of 700,000. So we're not solving the problem. The problem in other areas could indeed, as you suggest, get much worse. Then our solution will look like an even smaller contribution to the overall problem. But this is reasonable spending, and it's not at all trivial. And as I say, our numbers are conservative. Others have proposed larger network effects or induced employment effects. Maybe you can take an even more optimistic view that we're going to solve perhaps as much as a third of the unemployment problem in this way. But this is not the panacea. That's not what we're suggesting. Go ahead. I was going to also respond. Do you see the possibility? You've got to take this all out. After all, the real remedy is going to be measured. It's going to be measured. Now, Judge Ruth told me, oh, we're going to do it today. We're going to look at the secondary growth. Well, we're planning on that. I'm just kidding. We'll invade someone soon and stimulate our economy. No, actually, we have a different president now. We don't do that. We don't do that. Look, I think the key there is, I mean, first of all, the president just announced yesterday in Washington the largest, well, he hasn't done it yet, but he announced his commitment to make the largest increase in federal support for science in American history, which is fantastic. It's wonderful. But it's not a stimulus plan, although there is $13 billion, excuse me, $11 billion in the stimulus plan related to science, and it was science that could be done in a very quick basis, accelerated grants to scientists, about a million and a half, excuse me, a billion and a half for university and federal laboratory research infrastructure. So universities are using them. In the U.S., we have a big, we have a research infrastructure gap, if you will. Universities are using bad equipment, old equipment. They need to modernize that. So that's something you could do in the short term. I guess I would argue, though, with some of these more advanced technologies, like nano, bio, robotics, other things, they're not mature enough to really get commercialization within two to three years when you need it. I would argue there that that's really about a longer-term innovation policy that all nations have to develop and should develop, but it's not, you can't get enough out of that currently to really get this other kinds of job creation that we're talking about. Well, I think the answer to the issue of World War II is clear. You do accelerate technology development on a long-term basis. If you do it in two or three years, the entire new technology industry is effects. What you have to leave a piece of time cushion on a long-term organization is out of control. I guess it depends on how pessimistic one's view of the recovery is, and if the recovery is a five-year recovery, then I would agree with you. If the recovery is shorter, then it might not be, although I have to say your comment about stimulus, for those of you who know Rahm Emanuel, President Obama's chief of staff, he was quoted a while back saying, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Maybe I'd like to comment also on the, you said initially, if you invest in technologies now, how can you know that they will be the ones in two, three years to be the most efficient? Well, for example, Professor William Webb, who was the Ofcom director before, he's right on forecasting in telecom, and because of the slow standardization processes usually within these technologies, it's easy to forecast which technologies will be around in two, three years, but it's very difficult to forecast the usage. So investing in the infrastructure will enable the usage, but it's up to application developers and others to make the vision happen. So I don't see that as a big risk in a couple of years. Could I bring the gentleman at the back and then you? Thank you very much.
sorry, folks, I have to uh, go to another meeting. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, George. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll start out with, with, with one comment. To, you wanted me to disabuse you of this, and I'm going to do so. It, it, we're not presuming a pot of money. Uh, so this is not just a matter of taking money from the Treasury and allocating it, it uh, in, in, in a simple way. And, and the slide which uh, suggested a variety of policy mechanisms uh, was supposed to, to show that there are other forms of uh, stimulation or ways in which investment ought to be channeled into. Uh, so I would, I would want, for example, if Nesta's proposal for a swap of uh, spectrum for speed, I would want to monetize that and say that's worth half of the uh, five billion that we're using for the model uh, in broadband and stimulation, and then uh, another another quarter of it might come from uh, tax uh, incentives or, or of some kind, uh, leaving the treasury perhaps with an opportunity to channel through grants and other direct spending and procurement. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 125, uh, one, one and a quarter billion uh, pounds on, uh, using using the numbers for the model. So, we're not presuming a a, um, a pot of money. And in these different cases, the the kind of money spending would be different anyway. So, for ITS, a lot of it has to do with procurement, and a lot of the procurement is going to be done either by the highways agency or it's going to be done by uh, the municipal authorities or it's going to be done by county councils. Uh, so there again, a, a lot of government procurement, not from a single pot of money either. We're, we're just showing that by aggregating these different kinds of spending, getting it up to a certain level, you do have these uh, job re results. So I just wanted to, to disabuse you of that one. I think Rob is going to disabuse you of I'll some of the I'll disabuse you of everything else you said. <laughs> I think your point, which I think I got uh, about, you know, what about in the short run is this, it's this broadband installer, and the long run it's about these other companies. Um, in the U.S., uh, broadband investment is expected to fall about 10 percent in 09, absent stimulus. According to Warburg, Pincus could fall 15. Um, one of the biggest supporters of a stimulus package, as you would imagine, is the Telecommunication Workers Union. Uh, because they are seeing unemployment in their workforce. So if these either accelerated investments or regulatory interventions, whatever it takes to get BT, other companies in the UK to not cut CapEx in 09 and 010, that's going to keep telecom workers employed, which is good for them and it's good for the economy because it keeps up spending. In the long run, you know, maybe they will, maybe, maybe they'll get transitioned off. It's, as Kane said, in the long run we're all dead. Uh, in the long run, I don't, we don't really have to care that much about that. In the long run, you shift over. I'm, I'm, my son is uh, taking the AP. Do you have AP here? No. All right, well, <laughs> right. advanced placement uh, macroeconomics test. He's a junior in high school, so I've been helping him take the test. And it's sort of, you, you, get, you go back, to, oh, yeah, I remember that now. But there's the long-run supply curve and the long-run demand curve. And where we are now is that the long-run demand curve is b below the long-run supply curve where they meet. And so we're trying to move long-run demand up, or excuse me, short-run demand up to meet the curve. But what really, what, once, once that is over, the key task of economic policy is to move the long-run supply curve outwards. In other words, to expand the output capacity of the UK economy. That's the key task of public policy and economic policy. And the evidence is just frankly simply overwhelming that a big component of how to do that is ICE is moving to digital Britain. You know, that is a big component of how you do it. It's not the only component. I'm not saying that. There are certainly multiple other factors. But probably over half of that is moving to digital Britain, digitizing large parts of the British economy, even more than they're digitized today. That's where you get these big uh, long-run economic gains. Now, that frankly is why um, we did another report recently um, uh, where we benchmarked the U.S. against European countries and some Asian countries on innovation-based competitiveness. That's why, frankly, the U.S. has pretty good productivity. You compare our productivity, another report that was over there looking at U.S. versus European productivity. In the 70s and 80s, European productivity was twice as high as U.S. productivity. 
since ninety five european productivity has been half as high as u s so they just the curve just went like this and that's because the u s leads the world frankly in i c t usage in more more or less particularly in enterprises so I, I think that in the long run, uh, doing these investments, you get short-run benefits, and then you get different kinds of long-run benefits. Maybe yeah. I just want to comment no, briefly. Or should we? Just briefly comment, because you raised the question, uh, should, should the, um, who should champion within the uh, government, and should they focus on small companies or large companies? I felt you had a, you, you said maybe large companies are more efficient and have a bigger network. Potentially, you said something like that. Well, uh, but, but we've seen in Canary Wharf the ability of uh, various uh, solutions to that kind of problem from BT and from the hosting uh, companies that locate there. And uh, those things seem to have worked extremely well over the last 10 years. Uh, there's more to be done, perhaps, and you can generate more good business, but I think that it's not a, 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 a candidate immediately for this kind of intervention uh, at, at this point in, in, in the crisis. So that, that's why we can kind of separate those. And also, the fact that there's less of a market failure in this area. There's many more market failures on the consumer broadband side than there are on the business broadband side, and the large business broadband side. Uh, yes, sir, you had a hand up. Should I, should I start on the, the second let, question? Or let, 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 me, let me just give a general answer and then turn it over to Patrick, because Patrick, Patrick did the numbers. So, so, and and, and one, one part of the answer is uh, the, the model will be available, so you can play with it yourself. And, and then you'll understand exactly uh, how, how those calculations were, were, were fed in. Uh, the proportion of small jobs is taken as, the proportion of jobs in small businesses is taken as a proportion of small businesses in those subsectors, so they're each specific to the components of the larger category. So we did try to, to capture that, and that's why we have not a, not a uh, the, the difference differences in numbers. And I think some of that, uh, and indeed some of the leakage issue about how many of these jobs that uh, might be created or created abroad. Uh, 
came as a surprise to me because I hadn't studied that data carefully in the past. And, and Patrick in particular convinced me that uh, there, there are some very interesting features of the structure of uh, the UK uh, industry uh, that are, shall we say, uh, against uh, the common presumptions that people, people discuss. In, in particular, there's more here than, than we thought there was. And, and, and that and that that came. You know, I thought I thought all, all switches had just gone to, uh, excuse me, uh, Huawei. Uh, I guess Cisco makes them still. Uh, but in, in fact, there, there there's a lot of small businesses in the UK that that are, that are doing uh, thing things that contribute directly to that. So we took that into account as, as much as, as we could. Patrick, you want to drill down? Yes, I can do that because I sense the, the similar question in previous gentleman from BT, uh, this sort of division between SME and, and large companies. And that is, um, I think it's a very a interesting aspect of the report where, um, to explain in the broadband case, for example, the reason why most of the direct jobs come in large companies is because they are large companies in the telecommunications sector. It would be BT and others who would uh, build it out. Of course, in indirect effects, you would look at the suppliers to BT, and there you would have more higher SME um, grade. And then the um, induced effects, of course, that's people spending, so that goes to the, the general uh, general economy. But I would like to repeat what Jonathan said, that um, it was not maybe obvious to us either at all times modeling this, because you have so many variables. You have the salaries of the people. Um, you have an interesting aspect is that generally there is higher multiplication effects um, in the telecommunications industry and hardware, for example, and there is in services, which means that there are more indirect and induced jobs being created uh, in these sectors. And why that is is probably not a fully sort of discussion for today. That's more deeper sort of economic discussion. But uh, we have to share these sort of figures and uh, discuss discuss offline. But I think that's the biggest difference that a lot of the telecommunication companies are large. If you compare with the grids and, and the ITS, and then also to answer your question on retained versus new, if you think about um, uh, just BT hypothetically, let's say they're, um, they, let's just say you're, oh, I'm going to pick X company here in, in the UK that invests in telecom, and they decide because the market's not that good and it's hard to get money, they're going to cut their capex by 10 percent. In theory, they will cut 10 percent of their installers and people who do that, um, keeping those people on the payroll is just as effective to the economy as adding 10% on another company. So uh, in the short run from a stimulus perspective, retained is as valid as, as, uh, as created, um, but there's no, way to, there's no way to measure that. Well, you, 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 did, you did make this point that, that by, by uh, stimulating retention, you might be retaining otherwise unworthy occupations. And the, the truth is we did not take that fully into account in the model. But I think that in the sectors that we're talking about, we have less of a danger of that than would be the case in the other areas where uh, stimulus spending or, or induced uh, spending is, is, being, is being channeled anyway. Uh, so you could make that argument much more easily for the construction Home, home building uh, industry uh, and, and in the United States that discussion goes on. Yes, we should make sure that home building continues at the rate that it was going before. You know, and wait, wait, wait for the reaction of people who say, but the sales have stopped and you're just building more empty homes. Well, it is more of a problem in other sectors than in the sector that, that we're looking at here. You could argue that some proportion of uh, retained jobs uh, are, are maybe not what should be the policy priority. Uh, let me just clarify that. I, I guess I would argue a little differently that um, the issue of retained, I think what you're really getting at is, uh, or, or created, is, is, is a sector question, not, not, not a within sector. It's a between sector question, not a within sector question. So should the UK retain steel jobs or coal mining jobs, or I, I don't know. You know, you can have a nice argument about that, but the point on this is if 
people buy into this argument that these three digital digital infrastructures are critical to the future of the u k prosperity and quality of life and therefore we're going to you're going to accelerate investment in them it doesn't really matter retained or created it's the same occupation so it'll be the question is are there going to be a hundred thousand installers or are there a hundred and ten thousand installers are there going to be you know forty two thousand software programmers or forty four thousand and it's it's that's the question so I would argue that it's a little different than maybe what you're getting there I know you're waiting but I wanted to go for people who haven't had a chance yet so the lady over here Let me start on that from the U.S. perspective, and then I'll leave it to my U.K. colleagues here. That's been an argument sort of post-stimulus that some people have argued in the U.S., like, you know, why in God's name is the U.S. government investing in broadband, particularly in places where there's no business case for it? Uh, that's the reason, because there is no business case for it, or a reduced business case, and the market is already doing it where it can and should do it. And so the role of public policy in the case of broadband is to get wireless and wired broadband to places where it's a little bit more expensive than where the market can do it. You know, you're not going to put it in, in, at least in the U.S. case, in the igloo or the, you know, the, the hut in Alaska that's 200 miles from anywhere. But there are lots and lots of homes and businesses in the U.S. where the price of doing it, of providing the service, is marginally uh, higher than the revenues. And therefore, public policy at this point in time is a good, is a good thing because it makes the business case work. And I guess I would, in, in ITS, it's largely different because that's mostly public sector. And in smart metering, I would say that's the same thing. You're trying to make the business, you're trying to help make the business case work through essentially subsidies. Um, so that's not to say you would want to do stupid things, but in, at least in the U.S. case, all of the investments are essentially have to have a business stake in them. So business is making these investments. Uh, on their own with some sort of help by the government and so therefore the, I would argue they're not going to make incredibly bad investments or maybe once in a while you get that because companies don't always do, make smart decisions but overall I don't think it's a I think the business case can be there yeah I, I, I also think that at the level of this discussion first of all the smart grid does look very different from the broadband build out uh, and I disagree with you about your characterization of, this, of the smart grid and, and its advantages uh, adding up to just pennies uh, in, in the end. I think that, that this is, is talking about a, a transformation of electrical uh, distribution systems. Pardon? Pardon? No, I, 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 we, use, we use their, their analysis of, of, of metering, but metering isn't the only only component that we're, that we're talking about here. Uh, the, there, 
There are other kinds of problems that you point out about the use of additional spending or accelerated spending or other incentives for broadband build-out. And as you point out, there are only three who are building out broadband anyway. And what we don't want to do is to propose additional spending or other kinds of concessions to go to those who already were in the process of doing that spending. The whole discussion about BT's Next Generation Network program, its inception about eight years ago, the whole idea about designing it and beginning the spending, then how do I keep myself polite about this? The sorts of arrangements that were made effort with Ofcom to see that that spending continued. I don't have to be so polite. The press did say that BT is trying to hold Ofcom to ransom and get them to give additional concessions in order to just see the rollout of their program. Well, it raises a lot of ethical issues to begin with and forces us to look at what characterizes the market failure problem of broadband in general. And when we get to that, then we have to make, as you point out, the business argument for how particular kinds of spending can be justified as commercial investments. I'm happy to do that. It's not, as you noticed, in the remit of this report. And I think it is a distraction and it will be resolved in a myriad of different ways, many of them hard to predict in any detail. And so I think the task of describing those variety of choices falls somewhere else other than in a story about how employment effects are going to have these benefits from spending. So I'm sympathetic to your comments. I think that you should reconsider the relationship between smart grid and broadband when it comes to this kind of argument. We would want to separate them out. And it is important to get the business arguments stated, but the variety of business arguments which are really going to emerge over the next year even, to say nothing of the immediate years after that, they're not predictable in the form of this kind of analysis. Ann. I guess I would argue at the levels we're talking about, Australia is at a different, they're in a different universe on this. At the sort of popperish levels, I can't say five billion is popperish, but it's certainly not that level of certainly what Australia is doing on a per GDP basis. You don't even have those choices because you don't have, that's nowhere near enough to do fiber to the home. And so I think, but let's just say it was. Look, at some point in time, everybody's going to have fiber to the home. That's where Japan is. That's more or less where Korea is. That's where much of Sweden is. Fiber to the, fiber, what you call the cabinet, we call fiber to the node in the U.S. is a transitional strategy. And maybe with electronics, you can get the DSL, you know, ADSL high speed over copper. That's certainly possible. But it seems evolutionary that we're going to get there. So I guess I just, 
I, I, know, I know what you're saying, but I think on, in most of these cases, you're not going to have that technological substitution at these levels, and it'll really just be accelerating what you would have done in, other, in another way or sooner. So I think we sh probably should stop. And Patrick, yes. do you want to uh, tell us what we're doing? Well, we're, we're, we're going to stop whining and have wine now. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, we we'll continue discussions on the uh, fourth floor in this building. So if you just make your way out to the right, and then we have an elevator up. When you exit the elevator, there will be um, wine and drinks. Thank you for everybody's attention. Thank you. We appreciate Thank you. it. We'll see you up on the fourth floor. It's Pepe's Cafe. I hope, I hope. It's in Cafe Pepe? Yeah. OK, the, then on the fourth floor, you have to find, well, we'll, we'll guide you along. It's, it's over in. in uh, the other side of, of the building, but it's not a very large space. Okay, good. Hey, Chris. Oh. Oh, yeah, you know.